Okay, so the last thing we're going to look at this week is uh, section 1.2 and part of section 1.3. Um, I don't think we're going to finish it, so I, I know we won't finish it. So we'll end up kind of halfway through that section, but that's okay. Okay, so first thing they mentioned in this section uh, is just kind of some general problem solving tips, especially for, for word problems, like kind of how to think about going through it. So these are just some general suggestions. So anytime you have a word problem or you know some kind of problem you're trying to figure out, um, it's important to write down whatever they're giving you and then figure out what are they asking me to find. Because if you read a problem and you have no idea what they're asking you to find, then you're not even going to be able to begin to figure out how to find it. So you've got to figure out what it is they want you to find and what it is they're giving you. The next thing is to kind of figure out um, what approach you think would be a good, good way to solve the problem. Um, so if I gave you a word problem like, uh, you have a building 200 feet tall, it makes a 50 foot shadow, you're standing at the end of the 50 foot shadow and you look up at the top of the building, what angle would you be looking up at? What do you think that kind of problem, it would be very helpful if you took all those words and kind of turned it into It into what? Anything? A what? Um, so there are numbers in there. So we've got 50 foot tall build, whatever I said, 50 foot shadow. But besides the numbers and the words, because it's kind of hard to think about all that, it would be easier if you had what? A diagram. A diagram, yeah. So sometimes drawing a picture is a good, good way to uh, solve a problem. Um, if I said to you, tell me all the ways you can arrange the letters A, B, and C, what, would, what might be a good way to do that one? I wanted to know every way you could arrange those three letters. How could you figure that out? Well, Jake? Because that's not really a picture, right? Picture, drawing a picture, that's not going to help, but yeah. Yeah, you can make a list. So making a list is good, um, depending on how big. So if I said to you, I want to know every way you could arrange the letters A, B, C, D, E, F, G. Now a list is, is too much. Okay, so we'd have to try something else. Uh, what else we got? Okay, setting up an equation. That's a lot of times what we do. Um, so maybe if it's an equation um, about interest rate, you look up the formula for interest rate and use it. Uh, maybe if it's about distance and speed and time, you look up that formula okay, and set up an equation. Okay, page 13 has got a bunch of different suggestions for solving a, a word problem. So once you've decided, okay, what's given, what you need to find, <coughs> then you actually can carry out your plan. Okay, so now this is the part where all right, you've made your equation, now use algebra and solve it. Or, all right, now draw your picture, okay? Actually, do that stuff. All right, so we're going to look at um, a problem where there's a company that charges $15 to rent a car, and then they charge you 20 cents for every mile you drive. So, in this problem, there's really two variables. One is how many miles you drive. And the second thing, what is how many miles you drive going to control? Yeah. It's going to control how much it costs. So miles is in control. How much it costs is dependent on the number of miles you drive. That's why I put cost as the y value. And I'll mention this in a little bit, but the y value is the dependent. Cost is usually dependent in pretty much every problem. It depends on something. Maybe it's how many miles you drive, maybe it's how many minutes you talk, if you pay by the minute on a calling card, you know, something like that. But cost is usually dependent, so we make it the y. 
So what I want to do is write an equation that represents this situation. Okay, I want to write an equation where you tell me how many miles you drove, I plug it into the formula, and it calculates the cost. All right, so Isabel, what is my equation going to start out with if it's going to calculate um, the cost? Y. Yeah, it's going to start out y equals, and now we need a formula to find the cost. Um, how about Isaac? You think you could give me um, a formula to find the cost? Not sure. Well, what if, um, is there any one of these costs that you only pay one time? Like it doesn't matter if you drive 100 miles or 1,000 miles, you just pay that one time? The rent in the car, how much is that fee? 15. So we know it's going to cost $15. But now we have to account for how many miles we drove. Anyone else think they could give me that part? Yep. Point two zero x. Yeah. Point two zero x. All right. So now if you drove 100 miles, you take 20 cents times 100 plus the $15, and there's a formula that represents this. Yeah? Why is the zero red? Uh, it just randomly changes color. It depends on how, <coughs> it, how the board feels. Yeah. Yeah. The board's angry right now. So. <laughs> no, I think I, when I get close to it, like my other arm might affect something, but I guarantee it'll change color again today. It just does not. All right, so now let's use the model, which in our case is an equation, to find the cost if we drive 50 miles. Okay, so Nick, if I drive 50 miles, um, where does the 50 get plugged in? It gets plugged in for x. It gets plugged in for x. So the cost equals 0 0.20 times 50, that's the mileage cost, plus the initial fee of $15 to rent the car. Okay, so if we multiply that out, um, 0.2 times 50 gives me how much? 10. 10. So 10 plus 15. It would cost you $25 to rent the car in this situation, 50 miles. Now, if you drive 100 miles, double the miles, is it going to be double the cost? No. no. How come? Why not? Wouldn't that make sense? Double, you drive twice as far, you pay twice as much? Because there's one fixed value. Yeah, one of the values is fixed. You don't pay the $15 double, you just pay the mileage double. So, the 15 stays exactly the same. Now we're going to plug in 0 0.20 times 100. Point 20 times 100 gives me 20, plus 15 gives me a cost of 35. Any questions on that? Okay. So this thing right here in the box, that's the algebraic representation of our problem. If somebody walked in right now and looked at that equation, they would have no idea that it's about renting a car and you pay 20 cents a mile and $15 up front. All they would do is look at that and say, well, it looks like an equation in y equals mx plus b with like a slope and an intercept. But they would have no idea kind of the, the reasoning or the word problem behind it. Okay. So when you take the word problem out and you just reduce it to an equation, that's an algebraic representation of the problem. All right, so using the same example, the person renting the car is Sarah, and she was charged $50 to rent the car. I want to know how many miles she drove. Okay, so we're kind of doing what we did before, but what's different this time? Yeah. 
Connor? Uh, we get the y value and solve for the x value. We have the y value and we're going to solve for the x value. So we're going to do it <coughs> two ways. First way I'm going to show you is uh, the way you're probably familiar with. Just plugging it in using algebra. All right. So it's going to be 50 equals 0.20x. So you could put 0.2. You don't really need to keep the zero, but we can. 50 equals 0.20x plus 15. So 50 equals 0.20x plus 15. And now we just solve. So, Emily, what would be my first step to uh, uh, solve that? Subtract 15 from both sides. Yep. So we'll subtract a 15. That's gone. So I get 35 equals 0.20x. And Greta, uh, what's my last step? Divide uh, x by 0.20. Yep. And then 0.20. So 0.20 or 0.2, that's one-fifth. Okay. So dividing 35 by one-fifth is really like multiplying 35 by 5. So that's going to be 175. Okay. You can just use your calculator. Now, that's 175 miles, right? Because it's equal to x, and x was minus. So algebra approach um, shouldn't be anything new there. But any questions on that? OK, graph. So now we're going to use the, um, the calculator. Okay. I'm going to go back to what we had right there. 50 equals 0.20x plus 50. And the way we're going to solve it graphically is we're going to look at the left side and the right side and we're going to make two separate pictures. Okay. We're going to make a picture for what's on the left and we're going to make a separate picture for what's on the right. And the goal is to figure out where the two pictures are equal. Um, that sounds a little weird. What, what does that really mean? If you want to figure out where two pictures are equal. It really means where the two graphs you draw do what? Come. It would be where they intersect. It's going to be where they intersect. So the whole point of this is to learn how to calculate an intersection um, on the calculator. All right, so first thing I got to do is bring my calculator up, turn it on, go to y equals. It doesn't really matter which one you put where. I'm just suggesting to use y1 and y2. So I'm going to type 50 in y1. Hit the down arrow, 0 0.20, remember x is right below mode, plus 15. And now that's in y2. Any questions on getting that typed in? Now I'm going to start out with the, the standard window, and if I need to adjust, um, I will. Does anyone remember how we get the standard window, what we press? Uh, one of the buttons up at the, at the top. So window, we can type in something specific that we want. It's one of the options here that kind of gives us the, the starting point. Six. Zoom, which one? Six. Yeah, we start with the standard zoom. So that's negative 10 to 10 on the x, negative 10 to 10 on the y. So let's try it. And while the little yellow circle is spinning, it's doing something. Still doing something. Still going, and now it's done. So I've got a problem. Did I type something in wrong, or what? How come there's nothing there? My window is not big enough. First of all, y equals 50. That's a horizontal line at 50. Well, the highest I'm looking on my window is 10. So to go up to 50, do I adjust? The x min max or the y min or y max? Which one do I have to adjust? Huh? Y max. The y max. 
So we know it needs to go to at least 50, but if we do exactly 50, the line is going to be right on the edge of the top of the screen. So let's go a little past it. So now we're going to definitely see something. There's the horizontal line at y equals 50. The question is, is the other line going to intersect on the screen? No. We're not looking far enough to the right. And because we already did the problem with algebra, I already know the answer. I have to go all the way to 175 in order to see the answer. Well, right now I'm only going to 10 on the x max. If you set x max at exactly 175, it's going to be right on the edge. So just go a little more, go like 200. Now, while well, we're here, let's look at a couple other numbers. X, um, what was X again in this problem? What did, it, what did X represent? Miles. Miles. Does it make sense to have negative miles? No. So really, having X at negative 10 has no meaning. Um, if you want to set it to zero, you can. There's no reason to look at negatives. There's also no reason to look at negative cost. They're not going to pay you to rent a car. So really, you don't need to look at negatives at all. Okay, let's hit graph. So there's y equals 50. And here's our cost as we drive more and more miles. And right there is where they cross. Now, what you can do is you can press trace. And you can kind of scroll along it if you just hold the button down. And to me, it looks like it's about right there about 175, but we can do even better than just trying to trace and, and try to guess. There's a button that will calculate where they cross exactly. So to get to that, you press second, and then the trace button above it, it says calculate. So press second, calculate, and you should see this menu. And if we're trying to figure out where they cross, which one of these options do you think we're going to use? Intersect. So it's the fifth option down. You can use the arrows or just press 5. Now, anytime you want to find an intersect, you have to tell the calculator what two things do you want to find an intersect for. And if you look at that, you might be like, well, there's only two things on the screen, a red and a blue. Well, maybe on the screen sometime you might have a red, you might have a black, Maybe you'd have a green. The calculator can only find where two things cross at a time. That's it, two at a time. So if this was on your screen, you'd have to tell the calculator, all right, I want to know where the red and the green cross, or maybe I want to know where the black and the red cross, or the black and the green. You've got to tell the calculator which two lines you want to use. In our case, we want to use the blue and the red. It's the only two on the screen. So on the blue line, doesn't matter where, somewhere, you just hit enter. So I've just told the calculator that's the first line I want to use. And it, it can be curved too. If it's curved, that's fine. Now, it should automatically go to the second line. It should be in red now. If it's still in blue, okay, and you're basically saying, okay, I want to use the blue line as my second one, it won't let you. I already picked it for the first one. You got to pick a different line for the second one. So I just press down, and now I'm on the red one. So now I've told the calculator which two lines I want to use. The guess, you just kind of go as close as you can to where they cross. Hit enter, and it'll give you the exact answer 175. Did it work? Oh, okay. Now, if you're kind of wondering, what, why do you have to take a guess? It's because, let's say you had that on the screen. It said the calculator can only find one intersection point at a time. So if this was on your screen and you wanted both of these, you have to do it twice, one at a time. And the calculator is just not going to randomly pick one of them. If you put your guess closer to here, the calculator would give you that one. 
if you move the guess closer to here, the calculator would give you that one. That's how the calculator decides which one to give you. Now, technically, how many times do these lines cross on my screen? Just once. So the guess doesn't even, for this problem, it doesn't matter at all. You could put the guess wherever you want. So just to show you, all right, pick a point on the blue, red. Let me put the guess way over here. Now it looks pretty close. Looks like they crossed there. Not really. <coughs> it doesn't matter. Okay, since they only cross once, the guess is not really important. Okay, only in a situation like this. Okay, so any questions on that? Okay, so two ways to solve the same problem. Algebraic, graphical. Um, for this problem, I can do it faster with algebra than I could graphic. When the equations start getting a lot more complicated, it might be impossible to use algebra. So then we'll, we'll have to graph it. Okay, but this one you could do either way. Any questions on finding an intersection? Okay. Okay. So you're going to see these directions in the homework a lot. Find a complete graph. When you see the directions, find a complete graph. That means do it on the calculator. Okay. Do it on the calculator. How do you do it? Well. You basically type it in on the calculator, and you write down the window. How do you know what your window should be? Well, your window should include all the important features of the graph. So in our last problem, an important feature is where the lines cross. If this intersection point is off the screen, that's not a good window. It's not a complete graph. If I had a um, parabola, which we'll look at in a minute, seeing where the parabola bottoms out, that's, that's a complete graph. Okay. If you're zoomed in too much and you can't see the parabola on the screen, that's not good. Okay, so you want to be able to see all the important features. Any twists, turns, or any places where things cross. Okay, so let's try this one. Uh, y equals x squared plus 10. Okay. As we go on, we're going to start to learn a little bit about how this exponent affects the picture. But basically, what that exponent tells you is if you subtract 1 from it, it's how many times the graph can turn. So if the highest exponent is a 2, subtract 1 from it, you get 1. This kind of graph is allowed to take one turn. So it can go down, it can turn, and head up. If you had a graph with a 3 there, subtract 1 from it, you get 2. A graph with a 3 can turn two times. So it could do something like up, there's your first turn down, and there's your second turn back up. All right, so once we start to get familiar, we kind of know how many turns the graph could take, and then we can start to look for that on the screen. Okay. So knowing what to look for is kind of a combination of learning how to use the calculator, and then learning just kind of some patterns when you see certain exponents in the problem. Okay, so let me type it in. Um, if you have anything else in there, you can clear it out. We don't need that anymore. x squared plus 10. Okay, I'm going to go, I'm going to hit graph the way it is right now. So that's how my window is set. If I hit graph, do you think that's a complete graph? No. No. I've cut off half the parabola. It looks way too skinny. It's, that, that's not good at all. All right, so. I'm going to go zoom 6 just to reset everything. How about still going? How about that window? Is that good? No, now we don't see anything. Out of the four numbers you need to adjust, 
or you can adjust, there's only one you need to change. Anyone think they know which which one of the four mins and maxes you need to fix? Yeah. Y max. Yeah, y max. Okay, what did you try for a um, a value on that, Michael? Thirty. Thirty. Sure. Let's try that. Perfect. I can see the parabola perfect now. I can see both sides. I can see the minimum value. And if you're wondering what is the minimum, there is a way to find it with minimum. I'm not going to talk about it today, but you, you can find it. Um, this one is at 10. That's the lowest the parabola ever goes. And then it goes up from there. Okay. So what do we write down? Four values. X min. X max, Y min, Y max. So I think everything was the standard window except the Y max. Did you say 30, Michael? Yeah. Okay, he did 30 for that. That's what you write down. Write down the window. Now, if you did 20 for the Y max, um, sure, that's fine too. Um, Okay, if I did 20, it's going to change how it looks a little bit, but you're still going to see all the important features. Okay, that's fine. What I wouldn't do is something like this. Let's do 5,000. <laughs> so why do you think I said that's not really a good window now. Yeah? So big that it just isn't visible? Yeah, I can't even tell. I mean, maybe that's a parabola. Maybe it's part of a circle. I can't even tell now because it's so, it's so big. You flattened it out too much. And if you, if you set it even higher, like if you set it at like 50,000, it's probably just going to look like a blue line right at the bottom. It's not even going to look like it curves at all. So you can go too big. Okay, so you don't want to go too big. So that's an example of a parabola. So the general form of a parabola looks like this. Ours wasn't that complicated. Okay, in our problem, A was 1. So we have 1x squared. Um, B was 0. There's no x here. There's an x squared, but there was no x. And c was 10. As you change a, b, and c, you change the characteristics of the problem. You can stretch it out. You can compress it. You could even flip it so the parabola goes the other way. Okay, we're not going to get into it too much right now, but Changing A, B, and C changes how it looks. Can we have a parabola that goes like sideways? Um, yep, you can. Um, we're going to talk about that actually in a little bit in the next part. Um, the problem with a sideways parabola, which would look like this, is I can't draw it using just one graph. I have to draw it in two pieces. So there's the first piece, and there's the second piece. So there's your sideways parabola. If you put a vertical line, it fails the vertical line test, which means a vertical line hits it more than once. That's not a function, which is what we're getting to in the next section. So the calculator can only draw, technically, it can only draw functions, things that pass the vertical line test. Can I kind of cheat and make it look like I'm drawing something that fails the vertical line test? Like that? Yes. I could also do a circle the same way. I'd have to do the top half and the bottom half separate. But I could do a circle mm -hmm. as well. Okay. Well, we'll talk more about that in the next, the next section. Hey, let's, um, let's graph this one. Okay. Square root of x plus 20. All right, so I'm at a standard window. I did zoom 6 when I just typed in what I did, so I'm back negative 10 to 10 now. So I'm going to do square root 
x plus 20. If you want to see what I'm about to see, then press zoom 6. That's not a good window at all. Because from practice, I know what a square root is supposed to look like, and it's not supposed to look like that. Square roots are supposed to look like this. They're supposed to have a curve to them. If I can't see the curve, then that's not good. How do I know it's supposed to be curved? We just kind of learn that after we do more practice with square roots. And now you know, a square root function should have a curve to it. Now, what are you not allowed to do with square roots if you're sticking with real numbers? You can't take the square root of what kind of number? A negative. You can take the square root of zero, that's fine. But you can't take the square root of a negative. Okay, if you try, you get an error. Okay, calculator says error. Can you do imaginary numbers? Yes, but we're not we're not doing that. Not yet. So keeping in mind that what is right here can never be negative, how small could x be? What's the smallest number you could plug in for x and still not have a negative number under the square root? Yeah. Um, what about negative 1? <coughs> is negative 1 plus 20 a positive number? So negative 1 works. How much lower can I go? Negative 20. Negative 20. That's as low as I can go. If I go past negative 20, then we're going to have a problem. So let's set our window to go to negative 20. And since I don't want negative 20 right on the edge of the screen for my x values, I'll go a little past it. I know I'm not going to see anything because it can't go to negative 25. But I just don't want negative 20 right on the edge of the screen. So now let's hit Perfect. Now I can see it's a curve. We were zoomed in so much before, I, I think it kind of looked like a line. Now it looks more like what I showed you. Okay. So for a complete window, I'm just going to take these values and just put them right there. Um, that kind of messed up. That was a negative 25. So write these down, and write those down. That's your window. Okay. Any questions on that one? So this kind of starts us right off in the part of the next section we're going to look at, and that's what values are you allowed to plug in for functions. Okay, there's a name for that. Negative 21 is not a value you can plug in. Neither is negative 23, 28, negative 50. Those are not values you can use. 5, negative 3, 12. Those are values you can use. So there's a name for the ones you can and can't use. And now those names are on the board right now. So. When you're looking at a formula, the numbers that you are allowed to plug in for your x values, those are called your input or your domain. The domain is the set of values you are allowed to use in a formula. So in the last problem, the domain was any number negative 20 or larger. That was our domain. Okay. Another name for the x value is the independent variable. And then I've got some names for the y value. The output. So the output is what you get after you do the calculation. So in the rent-a-car example, plug in miles. The answer that you get, the output is the cost. Um, range. That's the uh, another name for the y value. And it's the dependent variable. Okay. The cost to rent the car depends on how many miles you drive. <coughs> cost is dependent on something else. 
Okay, I see. Hopefully you've seen those six turns before. But I'm just putting them up there just in case you had them. So, um, Shai had asked me about, well, can you graph like a sideways parabola? And I said, well, kind of. I can kind of cheat and do two halves. The so graphing calculator can only graph functions. Okay, it can only graph functions. What does that mean? A function is some kind of equation where every x value has only one y value. Let's look at this sideways parabola again. And let's just mark off a few, few lines. Let's say I go over to when x is 3. Okay. Right there. Well, if x is 3 and I said, what's the y value? You have two choices. You can either go up here and get a y value, or you can go down here and get a y value. That's a problem. That's not a function. If I get rid of one half of it, notice it looks like a square root function now, and that's exactly what a sideways parabola is. It was just two square root functions. I just mirror imaged it. That's a function. Because when x is 3, you only have one choice. Your graph is right there, the black dot. There's no other choice below it. So that's a function. Every input has one output. So how about a circle? Would a circle be a function? No. If you have a circle, let's say those are your axes, just a circle centered at the origin. Well, if x is 2, you could be up here, or you could be down here. That's, that's a problem. And an easy way to remember that is the vertical line test, which I'll mention at the very end. Okay, the vertical line test. Again, I'll, I'll put it on the board when we're all done. Okay, so another way of saying the same thing I've already said a couple times. Domain is what you are allowed to plug in. Range is the answer you get out. Unless the problem states otherwise, we're always dealing with real numbers for the domain. Okay, real numbers. In other words, not imaginary. Okay, so when we write down a function, there's two ways to do it. The way that it kind of looks on the graphing calculator, y equals, or the second way that's below it. Okay. We'll talk about that in Algebra 1. Does anyone know how you pronounce this left-hand side? You don't say like F, open parenthesis, X, close parenthesis. You don't say it like that. F of X. So this is F of X notation. We usually use the second notation, especially in a word problem. Like if I said to you, write a function that shows my distance, as a function of my time. So assume I'm driving at the same speed. Write a formula that shows me how far I will have gone after a certain time. Well, I might do something like this. D of t, my distance as a function of time. Okay, so these, these two letters can change depending on if it's, if it's a word problem. If it's just a generic equation, we use f, f just stands for function, just, just a generic function. Any questions on those two notations? Okay. All right, so let's see if we can find um, the domain <coughs> and the range of a couple different um, functions. When you're thinking about domain, the only thing you have to be careful about is two things. One, you are not allowed to take the square root of a negative. If that could happen, so if you have a problem involving a square root, your domain has to avoid that issue. 
You're not allowed to take the square root of a negative. You're also not allowed to divide by zero. So if you have a fraction problem, and you had something like this, I could never plug in a value for x that would cause the denominator to be zero, in this case, two. You can plug in any number you want besides two. You just can't use two in this problem. Okay, we're not doing this one, but I'm just showing you an example. So dividing by zero, no good. Square roots of negatives, no good. So what values could I use for x so that if I plug them in, x minus 3 is never negative. Like I could use 10. That's an example. 10 minus 3 is 7. That works. Negative 100. Oh, can't use that one. Negative 100 minus 3, that's negative 103. Too small. So what, what's the values I can use? Yeah. Would it be any number greater than or equal to 3? Yeah. So the domain is any number greater than or equal. So another way we can write it is using our symbol from yesterday. We can pick any number from 3. The bracket means equal to, including 3. So from 3 up to infinity. Okay. What I wrote on the right-hand side, that's called interval notation. The number on the left is the low. The, the thing on the right is the high. So from 3 up to infinity. But I put a parenthesis on infinity because you can't ever reach it. If you put a bracket on infinity, that means you can reach infinity. You can't. So infinity always has a parenthesis on it. And if I did something like this, that would mean every number from 3, not including 3. So every number from like 3.0000001 up to infinity. But I can use 3 here. That's, that's no problem. So I'm going to include 3 and up. Okay, and to get the range, what I usually do is just graph it and look at the calculator. So range is the y values. That's how high and low the graph goes. Domain is left to right. Range is up to down. So let me just type that in. I did zoom 6, that's going to work perfect for this problem. There's your domain. It's starting at 3, and it's going to the right. And if you think it stops at 10, it doesn't. If you set your x max bigger. What was the equation you took Right there. OK, it just keeps going. It's never, it's never going to stop going to the right. Now. Does this graph go up and down forever? What do you think? Yeah. It goes up. It does go up. What's the lowest value that it looks like it ever hits? Zero. Zero. It hits zero right here, and it goes up forever. It's not going up fast, but it's going to keep going up the further you go to the right. So the range. These are the y values. It goes from 0, and it goes up forever. just keeps heading up. So you can write it that way. Or from 0 up to infinity. Any question on that, finding domain and range? It takes a little practice. The range, it's usually very helpful to graph it on the calculator and look at the picture. A lot of times, domain, a little easier to do without a calculator. Because with domain, you just have to avoid the two things I told you. Okay. Uh, let's do, let's do, uh, just call this example two. I'm not going to do A. So it's really just example two. Okay, I'm going to do this one because I, I showed you earlier, I'd show you how to type in an absolute value. And that's what I'm going to do right now. So it's the absolute value of x squared minus 4. Let's start with the domain. So domain is what you plug in for x. Look at what you're doing to x. Are you taking a square root of x? No. Um, do you have a fraction where there's an x in the bottom of it? 
No. So you're not taking a square root. You're not dividing by zero. That means the domain is all real numbers. You can take any number you want and square it. You can square a positive number. You can square negative numbers. You can square zero, fractions, and decimals. You can take any number you want and square it. So domain, all reals. Or the other way to write it, you can take any number from negative infinity up to positive infinity, not including infinity because you can never get to infinity. Now the range. Okay, let's graph it. Now we're going to look at how high and low it is. Now wait, wouldn't it just be more than zero? The range? Yeah, it's just going to end up zero and up. Okay, that's the answer. So, let's, so to type in absolute value, okay, you go to math, number, and it's the first option. ABS stands for absolute value, at least in math it does. Okay. On my calculator, I get the two bars. So now I just type in x squared minus, make sure you use the minus, that's the gray button on the right, or it's gray on mine. Don't use the negative symbol below the three. Now, this is gonna want to be a parabola, right? x squared. That's a U-shape. The problem is the U-shape wants to go below the y-axis. Well, the absolute values are saying, no, you can't. So watch what happens to the problem. Let me do zoom six. <laughs> so it kind of wants to draw a parabola, but once it hits the axis, it can't keep going negative. Normally it would look like that, but the absolute value takes that negative part and flips it up, okay, because it can't be negative. So looking at it up to down, what's the lowest that my graph goes? Zero. Zero. What about the highest? Infinity. It just keeps going. So the range is any number from zero up. These two lines, they just, or sides of the parabola, they just keep going. So from zero to infinity. Any questions on that? All right. Um, so sometimes what they're going to do is they're going to give you a function. And they're basically going to say, plug in a number for the function, or for the letter. So if they ask you to evaluate, what that means is take what they're giving you and plug it into the formula. They'll tell you the formula. They'll tell you what to plug into the formula. You just have to do it. Okay, so for us, here's our formula f of x equals x squared plus 1. So I'm going to give you a couple values to plug in, and uh, we just do out, do out the arithmetic. Yeah, but that's what evaluate means, just plug in. All right, let's, um, I'm not going to do all of these, so don't, don't write them all down. Just write down the ones that I do. Um, we'll do negative 2. So you take negative 2, fill it in for x. And if I do without, what's, um, what's negative 2 squared? 4 plus 1? 5. That's it. So with numbers, pretty easy. Um, let's do <coughs> f of a. What am I plugging into my function now? A variable. A variable. Plugging in an A. So literally, plug in an A, and there's not really anything you're going to be able to do. A squared plus 1. That's the answer. OK. And I'm going to do the last one, x minus 3. So now, you're taking x minus 3, 
and plugging it in for x. So you've got x minus 3 squared plus 1. Now, remember, when you have parentheses and you have something squared, it means this. That's x minus 3 squared. Does anyone remember the name for how you do this? Yeah? Foil. Yeah, some people call it foil or the distributive, double distributive. x times x. x times negative 3 x times negative 3 again. That's negative 6x. And then negative 3 times negative 3 is? Negative 6. Careful, not adding times. Negative 3 times negative 3. Nine. Positive 9 plus one more. Okay. Okay, so you make sure you know how to Foil things out and then combine like terms. Okay. Any questions on that? All right. So last thing. I told you that not everything is a function. This is the sideways parabola. The plus part is a square root function that looks like that. The minus part is a square root function that's flipped over. That's what a sideways parabola is. Two square root functions, mirror image. So in order for something to be a function, every input has to have one output. Okay? Visually, there's an easier way to think about it. In order for something to be a function, your picture has to pass the vertical line test. The vertical line test says you can take a vertical line Put it anywhere in your picture, and if you put it in the picture somewhere and it hits your graph more than one time, you do not have a function. That's not a function. It's hitting it twice. How about, I think I might have asked this one earlier, but how about a circle? Function? Nope. Because I can take this, I can move it, I can put it so it only hits once. But the point is, I can do it so it hits twice, not a function. Um, how about a parabola? Function or not a function? That's a function. The sides get steep, but they don't ever go straight up. It only hits it once. Okay. How about something like this? That's a sine wave. Does a vertical line ever hit that more than once? No. Nope. It's only hitting it one time. A horizontal line would hit it more than once. That, that's something else. Okay, we'll talk about the horizontal line test much later. But that's the vertical line test. Okay, any questions on that? All right, so homework tonight. Uh, the first part we did was section 1.2, so that's page 20. Okay, and the problems there just kind of skip around. So it's 6 through 10, 18, 21, 29, 32, 38. And then on page 30, uh, those kind of skip around too. So 3 through 8, 11, 13, 16 to 19, and 24. Okay, so we'll go over that tomorrow uh, before the test. We'll be after school for a little bit if anyone needs extra help. I'm also free period nine if you wanted to come in, um, if you have to study. Um, and as far as a reference sheet, somebody asked me about that, you can make a reference sheet. Um, I don't think we really did any formulas that you'd need to know, but if you want to make a reference sheet, um, you can. 